Welcome back, guys, to It's a Darmer podcast. To May, today, we have a familiar face called John Fry. He has been already on my podcast. I really love his work. I have been admiring his work for a long time. And he is a vehicle concept designer. And he has a very specific style, if you ask me, especially with design, which is very important to me. And I think many of you already know him. If you don't know, please do check his work because it's something amazing. Hi, John. Good morning, good afternoon over there, or evening. How are you, yeah. Dharma? Yeah, I'm very good, to be honest, especially that you came to the podcast. I always tell you how much I admire your work and your design. You know that you have a very Likewise. special skill set. Well, thank you very much. You have a very yeah. specific aesthetics, which I adore. Thank and you. Yeah, I try to do something unique. Yeah, you definitely do. And I always yeah. wondered, how did you push your limits to get to there. Let's immediately start with the spicy stuff. How did you push that limits to have such limits. a good eye, such a good hand movement and to think in that way? Uh, well, the whole life story, of course, um, I'm just one of those, you know, kids that obsessed about wheels, vehicles at an early age. So this is, uh, you know, drawing with, uh, crayons and, and such before, um, before I was doing any school or anything, you know, that was, I had good concentration back then, I think. And, uh, okay. you know, I just, I just love to create, but I, I remember sitting at the dining room table with, uh, the, the neighborhood kid friend, a little bit older than me and watching him draw and, uh, the shape that he was creating on the paper, remember the, the specific outline of what he was doing. And I was asking what he was drawing and he said, I don't know. And, <laughs> I, but the just the magic of the the really neat line that was coming out of it, um, and I could just see something kind of taking shape, and I thought that was really fascinating. Um, my dad had some really good artistic talent as well, but he just didn't explore a career in that. And I think uh, he has a very meticulous eye for detail, the uh, kind of finish, uh, craftsmanship, that sort of thing, and all the work that he did. But yeah, when I was a kid drawing all the time. And, you know, even when I was in kindergarten, I started to draw like seven eighths views of, of vehicles and starting to think about perspective. And, um, you know, little kids would come up to me and go, you're a really good drawer, drawer. That's, it's not, drawer. not a word, but they wouldn't say artist. And I was always averse to being something like an artist and painting sunflowers out in the field, like Van Gogh or, um, you know, that, that kind of lifestyle didn't appeal to me. So I, I wanted, uh, a little bit more high zoot, uh, financially secure career and, you know, figured out uh, industrial design, uh, career through, uh, star Wars sketchbooks, you know, star Wars was, was a huge impact on my little brain when I was five years old and the first movie came out and I was drawing star Wars stuff for five years, uh, <laughs> which was probably good for getting my, my perspective skills and hard surface kind of drawing kind of, uh, started, but I had really good teachers when I was going to, to school as well. Um, I took drafting classes back in the day when it was just, you know, pencil and straight edge on board. And that really helped with uh, craftsmanship and uh, level of finish, you know, keeping your paper clean and all that stuff and line weights. Um, that was that was pretty big. So I, I did that in high school. I did that in junior college. But I had it pretty well figured out that I wanted to get into uh, – the car design field and specifically go to art center, um, after seeing like an art center catalog in high school. And that really, really appealed to me. I remember going to the, the college, visiting the college <clears throat> and seeing those big 20 by 40 renderings back when they were doing marker and chalk for everything and just being blown away by it. But I didn't understand the process. So, um, I was trying to execute those big gradations that they did in chalk with, uh, uh marker airbrush and, uh, you know, I just didn't have the the tools and I didn't know what, you know, what tools to use for it. So I was just looking at the final result and trying to dissect it and work my way back and try to figure it out that way. Um, but I've, my, my particular style, I mean, there's of course art center in there that people recognize that I guess is a distinctive thing. I think a lot of us that went to art center don't even recognize what that look is. Um, yeah, it's evolved. I mean, mine is probably more than 1990s art center. So 
you know, Nick Pugh was such a huge influence on us. Um, you know, Nick's work probably, I hope. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, every, uh, yeah, he also mentioned him, uh, Nick, he also mentioned him. I mean, your generation had some highly talented names there. Like, yeah, I had some really great classmates and people that were really close, um, like a term above me or two, um, or even below me as well. But back in the day, we didn't have Pinterest boards. Now, the, all this history is going to sound really interesting now because we're getting so far removed from it. But uh, yeah, to see like Nick's work, we had uh, photographs. So basically students would take photographs of the senior uh, transportation design finals room and take pictures of their 20 by 40 renderings. And then they would color copy them. And then people would share the color copies around. So we'd have like some of these like third generation color copies of copies of copies um, of people's work. Um, Paige Bierman stuff, I think was in there. There was an alpha project that he did. And, uh, um, Tim Prentice, his stuff. Um, but like the term that I started, uh, was the Honda Indy project. Um, those were the seniors, they were doing this project and it was, it was an awesome, uh, <laughs> one of the best, uh, senior final project sponsored projects ever. So half of them were doing the, um, the Indy car itself. And then another half were doing, um, the transporters trucks, uh, so like Bobby Ray Hall came to look at the final and there's a bunch of executives from Honda and all that. Uh, but they were having a, a heck of a time. It was, it was, it was a lot of fun. So that was like Robert Bauer, uh, really talented guy. He does a uh, ballpoint sketching. He, he uses a ballpoint yeah. pen, like an airbrush. Um, and, uh, Andre Fry was in that, uh, Diego Luna did this awesome Topo Chico, uh, car and, uh, the renderings he did of it were just mind blowing. I, I just remember being really influenced by what I saw in there. Uh, yeah, just the the amount of talent that goes through these these universities, CCS as well. We've we've had so many great designers um, come to Honda from CCS. I yeah. keep on saying Honda, but <laughs> yeah, that's that's where I spend most of my time. Uh, when you mentioned uh, Pasadena and CCS. I have a feeling that those are the two strongest universities in the world and they have been for a quite long time. There is also Royal mm -hmm. College of Art in London and oh, there yeah. Italy. Four times four times an excellent school Sports as well. Sports Sports is a really good one. I was also mm -hmm. I first asked my dad to go to Pasadena, but then we saw the price and he was like, forget about it. Then we checked yeah. Ford, but then I got Lamborghini scholarship, went to Milan, but Fordsheim was number three. I saw that. However, what mm -hmm. I want to ask now, since you have been 25 years in this industry and uh, I really love aesthetically how your images evolved. Like there is a certain, you can see that you're a Sedena student. It's very visible in it, but you come from a generation that evolved in different ways. I have a feeling sure, yeah. this is what I'm seeing. Maybe some people will get insulted with this, but this is my opinion. <laughs> I have a feeling the, the last generations that were great on Pasadena CCS is still 2013. And I will, I will explain why. Because there was hmm, still... Very specific year. Very specific, and I will tell you why. Social media came there in a full event. And uh, mm -hmm. I have a feeling that your generation was really exploring themselves who they are. Like you had people with ballpoint, uh, point, you had people who used markers in a specific way and so on, and they were mm -hmm. exploring. We are now in 23 to 2023, which is amazing here. There is everywhere material, you can find it. But I have a feeling, not a feeling, I see it, that people are not exploring inside who they are at all. They are just bouncing from one technique to another. Do mm -hmm. you, do, can we talk a little bit about that? Because it's very specific to me that I'm seeing it, you know? Yeah. And I don't, I don't know if there's a specific year for it, but I think <laughs> one of the, uh, the worst kind of habits that young designers have is uh, Pinterest boards. Um, I, I tell my class to, put together Pinterest boards and collect collections, but, um, that's for like concept design classes and, uh, it's for trains and airplanes and understanding the history of vehicles, um, not for styling ideas. And you see the, the auto styling industry, 
stagnate a little bit because they're mm-hmm. recycling what's the the latest cool sketch they got 20,000 likes on on Instagram and yeah, th- yeah. somebody throws it on Pinterest and we see the same body side uh, applied to a car um, over and over again. I see student portfolios and, and I see the same stuff over and over again. So I, I tell my, my students, be it concept design, storyboarding, you know, uh, whatever prop design they're doing um, to really try to forge your own identity. That's that's really, really important to uh, make yourself stand out. So in hiring that I've done, I've, I've looked at so many portfolios and uh, you don't realize the volume of students that are coming out of schools every year all around the world. And um, the, the thing that makes you comfortable um, seeing your design and it relates to some other design, um, it's better to kind of push ahead and get outside of that comfort zone a little bit so you stand out. Because um, I, I remember when I first got out of school and, and I saw somebody actually look at my portfolio. This is physical for portfolio when they're flipping pages. And you see how, how fast a hiring manager goes through a portfolio. And it's it's really fast. It's just one page, one page, 30 seconds, one page. literally. That's, yeah, yeah. I'm great point. 30 seconds, yeah. literally. Yeah, and these these are all images that you spent eight hours, five hours on each single image, but um, they're just getting the overall impression, the overall feel of your comprehensive work. And if you're, if the overall feel of your portfolio is, this is more of the same, then there's no reason to hire you. So yeah. hiring designers is all about adding something different to the conversation. They don't want somebody that's regurgitating stuff that's out there now. They they want something that's like, oh, what's that? So I I always talk about what are ways to stop somebody's attention, um, not stop their attention, stop their uh, their movement and focus on a piece for a longer period of time. Um, I even remember when I was in school and watching people walk through our project room and kind of studying. Uh, where they stopped and trying to figure out why they stopped on certain pieces. And um, one of my, my classmates, good friend of mine, Craig Kember, his, his work always got people to stop and, and look at his um, uh, illustrations for a longer period of time. They would pause and, you know, his, his work was fantastic. And I think there was something about um, the looseness of it as well. Yeah. And I, I'm not a loose illustrator. <laughs> I, I try to be more. Um, but I think when when you don't explain everything very clearly, uh, the mind has to work to understand it a little bit more. Yeah. So um, it, it's almost like if somebody's like a low talker or you don't hear very well and you really have to pay attention a little bit harder, it's a little bit of that. So the the drawing draws you in in the overall impression but it doesn't tell the whole story immediately. So you have to focus clearly on it and try to understand it. It's, you know, portraiture that's, that's photorealistic is the most boring thing to me. Um, okay. But when you start to get into some abstraction, um, it could be like uh, Francis Bacon or, um, or even like, uh, like Munch or, um, uh, I don't know. Some of some of the artists that don't just uh, make things exactly representation and try to represent reality um, directly, but they they start to twist it a little bit and yeah, make it a little bit uh, confusing and make the brain work to understand it. Um, I think that's important. So I think I I'm not a person that that abstracts a lot, but I. I understand the importance of that. And I think conceptually is where I make my, my big leaps. Um, And I think it frustrates some people that look at my work because my work does start to look very realistic in terms of lighting and, and uh, rendering. Um, But the engineering of it is impossible. And it makes people mad sometimes. Oh, that that wouldn't work. And they say, "Well, that's not the point. the The point is to push fantasy. It, it's concept design, or it's being playful 
you know, I mash up different genres, um, that sort of thing. They, uh, I, I, I think that's where the fun is and yeah. the illustrations that I do on my, my own, you know, most of the stuff that you see out there, it's, it's playing around. So this is going back to me with crayons at the dining table when I was a kid or playing with Legos or whatever. I'm, I'm just putting stuff together and, and seeing what works and having fun with it. I'm not, not looking at somebody's work and, and, trying to take pieces of fenders out of their car and put it together in something into my own. I'm, I'm really trying to do something new. <laughs> yeah. And, and one of the things that's kind of interesting about new is um, sometimes I'm new, but I'm new for 1958 or new from 1965. So I'm going back into a time period and producing something new of that, that different era, um, which I think is a lot of fun. It is definitely a lot of fun. It looks amazing. I love it. I don't understand how can people, I mean, I understand they can get angry. People are very strange beings, to be honest, but they, I can expect them to get angry because of envy, because they can do it on that level, to be honest. But uh, exactly what you are saying now, and this is going to be a great talk, trust me on this, uh, because uh, when when I show to people before I got recognized as an artist that I'm good at what I do and my name came up people mm -hmm. were also telling me that something doesn't work funny thing when you become a little bit of a brand immediately it changes they trust you completely but yep. especially and uh, it was very specific people uh, which did uh, specific things in their life mechanical engineers technicians mm -hmm. uh construction workers like that do very specific with electricity and stuff like that because they have to be very precise and when they see something that's not precise immediately their brain triggers this is not possible uh, yeah. i always say uh world needs artists because we push those boundaries there are of course bad artists that push it in a very bad way but 30 percent pushing something forward and seeing if it's possible gives completely new vision to the world one of the movies that did that was james bond i remember all these gadgets from there in mm -hmm. 90s 80s, it looked impossible in the 95 for example from the 70s we had that in 2000 we had if they didn't do it nobody would think of doing it yep. so, so i understand when people get upset but mm -hmm. I like when well, it's open open idea to make something it's very important than being just a stylist yeah. In, in my classes where I'm teaching design, um, I, I, one of the lectures I have is I draw this, this, uh, spectrum range and on one side of the spectrum, uh, is, uh, reality. The other side is like fantasy. And so your storytelling, um, be it for a video game, a movie or whatever is going to exist somewhere on that spectrum. So on the reality side, you have something like 2001, a space odyssey or, or a gravity or something where they bring in NASA consultants to say, uh, if, if the airlock worked this way, how would the character interact with it? And then on the other side, you have something like, like star Wars, you know, um, bombs in space, um, people floating through space, noise in space. Uh, there's no sign science behind it. It's basically yeah. comic book sci-fi and that's just as valid. That's entertainment. So concept design is producing design for entertainment and, your design work can fall anywhere on that spectrum and uh there's there's a time and a place for for all of it so um you know it depends if you're working for stanley kubrick or tim burton i mean you can look at how batman uh franchise shifted from tim burton to uh nolan and nolan went for the the hardcore reality like a yeah. plausible batman essentially so uh, ex military hardware used as the uh, the tumbler, the Batmobile, um, as opposed to this thing with giant wings on it, which is, you know, this the styling of it is is comic book style, but um, there's there's a tone to it that has its kind of place, right? So yeah, um, it's all valid, and it's it's good to be able to do a little bit of everything. So you know, you can switch from doing the the super fantastic impossible stuff to super super reality and working with uh, actual engineers and stuff 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. But I think that the uh, gap is g- becoming smaller and smaller in movies and real products because technology is, technology is advancing a lot. There mm-hmm. is still a gap, but it's getting closer and closer. Ten years ago, when you designed for video games, if you check the designs and everything, you will see that uh, many characters and their armors don't work at all. Yeah. Very rarely, very rarely. Halo, Halo, Halo is the one of them where everything works, which is amazing. But most of the designs, they have a too big shoulder and so on. The more yeah. in the last 10 years, it's getting closer and closer to movies and movies are getting closer to reality, which is crazy. Yeah, I think because video games, they're, they're basically, you know, they're calculating the physics of everything. So armor clothes has to fall in a specific real way. They're, they're, they're creating something they're putting into a real world simulation uh, as opposed to something just exists as pixels and then you can just do whatever yeah. you want. So yeah. it, it becomes a little bit constraining a, a little bit and there's there's less inventiveness with video games than there were like in the 19, early 80s when you're just pushing pixels around and doing the, the, the crazy stuff the Japanese companies came up with back then. Like would Mario Brothers, Super Mario Brothers been created today if we'd started like super reality stuff i don't know if it would or yeah. not well everything lives when it should live and everything is born yep. when it should be born not just humans <laughs> i like to say it like that because uh if for example something like as you said mario brothers happened now i don't know if they would be so successful i don't know to be honest you know because yeah, it might be a little bit silly right everybody yeah. everybody wants more reality I think that the world is becoming gloomier and darker because of that reality a little bit, to be honest, you know, because yeah. reality can be very gloomy and dark. And there's an ebb and flow to it. I, I think it's 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 like the 1970s repeating themselves. The 1970s in the United States, they started to go to um, a lot of gritty police dramas and really kind of brutal, violent movies and lots of movies with, with bad endings. Yeah, and, and that that followed the the optimism of the 1960s and and stuff, and I think it just caught up, and uh, I, I I hope it's going to go back up. I think it will, but yeah, right now there's there's not a lot of happy headlines <laughs> in the news Absolutely. right now. Absolutely, and that's, yeah, but- yeah. Personally, just I, I just want to speak that my uh, design kind of prerogative for my personal work is to avoid um, adding to um any sort of violent uh kind of design creation i don't think i need to world build in that area it's it's well covered so <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to fight against that a little bit uh you know there's there's a time and a place for of course defending your country and, and doing all that stuff but um i'd rather kind of exist in a more positive world building for my own stuff that's why i like race cars you know my my concept of the um like World War II fighter planes mixed with with race cars is it's a whole concept of replacing um, war with um, competition on the track as a way to determine conflict. Um, Speaking so that, about that the airplanes sort of that you like. Speaking about the airplanes that you like, and I adore them. Uh, the first ever air battle that happened in the world was between Germany and Serbia, and it happened literally above me here. First World War. Oh, really? The You're first in uh, Belgrade? Yeah, yeah. First ever battle between the planes. When I read that, oh, I was, really? we, we lost. They had better planes, so we lost, but we fought with them three on three. The first ever I battle. A, a great yeah. uh, World War. Is it, this is World War One, obviously. I, I, I'm kind of obsessing on World War One planes right now because uh, World the graphics, War one for is, one is, thing. Yeah, as much got, as it is. Aha, uh, uh-huh, you have a you have a book. Yeah, I might. I I think I packed it up. I I was uh, going to teach a class, and it's in the. But okay. yeah, the all that stuff really is kind of exciting to me right now, and I kind of want to mash it up a little Jeez. bit more. I did that VTOL um, World War One plane. Uh, I kind of yeah, want to go with some more concept like the that the colors yeah. are amazing. Yeah, I mean. Huh. Uh, as, as much of world war is devastating to to humanity the humanity also evolves a lot during it both technologically and emotionally which is there is always white uh, there is always yin and yang 
And I always mm-hmm. say that world wars technologically we really advanced during that time. I mean, it was devastating oh, yeah. world, but we evolved. And when you look at that the technology, airplanes, what they were doing, and how brave people were were back then, I'm always mm-hmm. fascinated. And that's that's what I want to talk about. Uh, I mean. From my point of view, I observe observe a lot what's happening around me, what kind of political things are happening, how the world is yeah. changing, and the world is changing always. There is no question about it. As the world oh, yeah. is changing, the art is following and design is following. Where do you think we are going with design and art in the future? Um, art, like fine art. I mean, that's a pretty pretty big range if we go from design to to fine arts so let's go in design I would, I <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, if you want you can answer but i apologize if i place the question this, to me, you know this is where uh ai becomes the immediate uh subject matter um because yeah. that's going to affect us more than anything probably uh, in the conceivable future so i think ai is going to um increase the value of traditional media artists and also uh people that can think independently um, yeah. it'll, it'll probably hurt the job market for, for people coming out of school a little bit and that that'll be incremental, but, um, the capitalist system generally, um, will create, um, a need for the most efficient process, whether you like it or not. So any giant corporation, if they don't use AI, they're going to, lose their lunch essentially to other companies that do you you can't just bypass the technology um for you know your own personal reasons or the 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 kind of the the goodness of humanity kind of thing but you you do have to control it of course um so as creatives when you're coming out of school you have to figure out um what's your niche as an artist existing in a world uh that has ai in it um and it's still about coming up with the best ideas. So um, the last year and a half or so with Mid Journey, um, I saw a flood of new artists um, on Instagram and they're all producing the same thing. So they're like, oh, it's great. I'm an artist now. I can do anything. And I saw so many pictures of chicks in space helmets. Of course. This this was like, they 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 all did that. And I'm like, so you now have the talent to create anything you want and you're just creating the same thing as everybody else. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not concerned about that. Um, and I don't, I don't know what the, the future is. It's very hard to tell right now. So AI affects art, but it also affects um, all sorts of uh, project management, um, uh, discussions, newspaper writing, script writing, um, all sorts of things. And there are some people that are traditionalists that are fighting against using it at all costs. So, um, uh, Peter Jackson, I think, uh, um, who's the, so the, uh, the guy is in disgrace. Yeah. So, some directors like, no, I'll never use it. Um, and I think in film you have an option because it's, it's the final product that, that comes out. That's unique. It's a piece of art in itself. Um, but you compare that to um, the automotive industry or something where profitability is based on timelines and um, you know, how much it costs to develop a a vehicle. I think that's where you're going to see usage um, kind of accelerate probably, but it may not be in, in concept creation as much as a tool for helping designers get their ideas out quicker but it's still, I think, going to be their their ideas that uh, um, are of value more than what is regurgitated by an AI system. Um, it's I don't know I I've, I've thought a lot about it and um, I think um, what is it the uh, Viscom software? Oh, okay, Viscom, yeah, uh, that, everybody that's Viscom. really useful designers because they can draw uh, a line drawing and it puts something out, but. Uh, to me, I don't understand why anybody who has the talent and the skills uh, would want to give up any of the creative control of the process. So even even uh, Viscom, where you're inputting a line drawing and it's shading in for you, it's actually doing surfacing 
uh, decision making for you. Yeah, um, it's moving stuff around um, between the lines quite a bit, and um, I wouldn't want to, um, you know, surrender that control to a system because you you can just say, "Well, give me five results, I'll pick one," but you're still picking from something that it's created. Um, as a time saver, if if you don't um, feel like you have to have ownership of what you create. Um, and you're okay with the results it gives you, that's, that's fine. But, um, my, my artwork's a little bit different because it's, it's personal work and I enjoy the process so much. Um, I'd say it's like, it's kind of like sex. Um, it's very I don't want to just, <laughs> I don't want to push a button to get the orgasm. I want to enjoy the long that's time good. getting there. I'm in, I'm in no hurry. I, I want to enjoy that the entire process. I sit here, my my little den of creativity with my my music blasting, and I'll have a, a nice beverage with me, and uh, you know I'll take my time with it. And that's how I spend uh, my weekends and and late nights is just you know enjoying the process of creating something. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I I don't have a need to rush that for personal work, but this is where I think my personal work and professional work separate. So if somebody's pay, paying me for my time and they need a result, they need a, a design, um, I would probably be upfront with any AI that I would use in my process and say, I didn't draw this background. This is AI produced background for this illustration or whatever. Um, but I think for projects, I would be happy to work with clients that are patient and are willing to pay for my time to do things manually. So if I'm able to pick and choose, that's the clients that I would try to work with. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, this uh, thing that you said about taking your time and so on, this sums up why am I saying that designers that are after 2013 I don't know if they will be successful and I will elaborate now. And I'm really glad that you, all of what you said. I, I know you're going with this. I think I have an idea. Yeah, I, I you say. very openly say it because the world has changed. The world is not mm -hmm. anymore. And, and I will say in which direction the world has changed. Uh, we have a saying here in Serbia. Uh, actually, it's not the saying here, but generations before had one wife. You have one woman. You need to love her, take care of her, protect her. Today, when I open YouTube 2023, one woman, second woman, third woman, fourth woman, I'm winning in life. I'm going left. I'm going right. I'm going left. There yeah. is no joy in that. Mm -hmm. There is no yeah. joy in that. There is a completely, that's overachieving and trying to prove to everybody that you are cool, which doesn't feed the soul. One woman feeds, one right woman feeds the soul. So I'm not going to go too much into that. But the point is everything today is like one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And uh, <laughs> there is also there is also the thing where your generation had a really problem with finding material, where to learn from, what to learn from. Mine had mm -hmm. also, but it was open a little bit. Today, and you were hungry. You were super hungry to find. The best ones were the hungriest that were looking the most to find it. My generation was similar. We had a little bit more, but we also had to be hungry. Now everything is like this. Here you go. But today, and I think it's much harder to be hungry in this yeah. way, you need to be hungry to not eat all the food. Yeah. But yeah, I you agree. You lose yourself completely. Your art yeah, yeah. is amazing. Your design is amazing because on your surfaces, you can see how much love, tenderness, and time it took to make that design. It's very visible when you see the design. There may be somebody who doesn't understand the design, but they will, they will know it. And yeah. And I, I think my process is, it's not something that you can apply to most uh, work because there's not enough time to put into that um, yeah. at that level. Um, so like professional work is not quite as tight as a lot of the illustrations you'll see me post. Um, but I hope that when I present that level that people kind of strive to achieve that, that level of finish, um, even if they don't get there, I, I want it to be inspiring in that way. But I, I agree with it, what you're saying. And I, th I think it's a little bit, everybody has attention deficit, uh, yeah. disorder. Um, you know, we scroll through 
YouTube videos so fast and, and tick the TikTok. I don't do TikTok, but um, even like uh, Twitter was all about saying things as short and quick as possible uh, and, and getting to the next subject matter or whatever. So everything is in little bits and there's not a lot of focus. So when I listen to music, I, I'm very anti kind of uh, short story kind of in little bits. I like to have the cohesive uh, thing the over the the whole um, album, for example, I'll play the whole album yeah. from start to finish. I don't do MP3s because I don't want that artist's work chopped up in little bits and mixed with Britney Spears and uh, yeah. ACDC all together and make this confused mess of stuff. So um, I, I like to take the time and focus on something um, in what I consume and also what I produce. So, you know, food beer that people have spent a lot of time on. I, I don't do fast food. I want to go to a nice restaurant where they've, they've taken the time to produce this well and they care about it. Um, movies, the same, same kind of thing. You know, I don't watch TV sitcoms that, yeah. you know, the, the short kind of thing, I, I want to kind of get into it and enjoy it a little bit deeper and, and reflect on things. But I mean, what, what is the content? I think we, we get to something that's as short as possible. Can the human brain go back to have the patience to watch something like 2001, a space odyssey? Um, you know, this is my, my favorite movie, but Lawrence of Arabia, something like that. You know, it's too long. You know, they, they need action scenes. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we're maxing out The, the Marvel movies aren't doing so good now. Right. Maybe it's, maybe people are are waiting for a change. Well, I, I I don't know what to say anymore about that movies. I don't know what's happening with them, but people are expecting change. I mean, there is no question about it. Uh, I'm just thinking, where are we going with the movie? Something has to happen because they always stagnate, and then something new appears. And I'm just yeah, seeing- and there's not a lot of new either. They they just redo old franchises that were successful. They go, oh, this worked in the past. We'll just we'll re start it um yeah. i mean i i heard read somewhere i don't know how accurate this is but they're talking about redoing the original star wars trilogy like yeah I read it also. which yeah, yeah. is just it's hard for me to comprehend but they they run out of ideas to build on something and it's beating a dead horse at a certain point like how many how many spin-offs of characters can you do in these movies like side characters yeah and make a story out of them. Um, but, yeah. but that's the, the problem is they, they find the tools to do it cheaper and they go, well, it's not very successful, but it didn't cost us much to make. So um, we'll just keep on doing it and make a little bit of money on it. And they're, they're doing a, a volume uh, based business instead of like a, a quality business where they have one big hit. They just, Oh, we'll just, we'll just flood the market and overall we'll get, profitability off of it but yeah, it's not a focus on really doing good. some some new story i mean what what's the the biggest kind of new franchise that's that's come out that wasn't based on something that existed already it's it's hard for me to even think of what that would be so i mean um, you have stuff that came from video yeah, games but that existed all of them yeah, are they, 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 once because they don't need a lot of money and they're yep. playing safe safe they're super safe about everything and i understand them i mean now the movies cost a lot of money and uh, it's completely different than before if you really need millions to make it before you can make it with less money and yeah. i remember in 2000s you could watch uh, today everything is organized uh, let's say it like that everything is organized in 2000s i remember i could by accident find the movie and be like what is this what the hell is mm-hmm. this Oh, good now yeah the, easier to stumble across things right it wasn't pushed pushed on you now everything is pushed you have a the whole world is watching netflix and mm-hmm. you have certain new shows that come out every week and the whole yeah, world all the watching. recommended stuff and and the whole world is watching that and everything is getting unified because we are all watching that but then i have a question where do we go to look for something else i have no idea to be honest <laughs> Yeah, you got you got to like you got to work physically to scroll all the way to the bottom of that that feed step to find 
you know, things that are interesting. And the, the problem is that people watch the stuff that's out the recommended top list. So they go, oh, mm-hmm. this is the popular thing this week. It's like, of course it is, because that's what you're, you're pushing on everybody. And there's, there's all sorts of great content that you, you don't see. Um, I don't know. I, the creator comes to mind. I think that's probably the best kind of new sci-fi thing that's come out in a while. Um, yeah. so there, there is stuff out there, but it's, it's, it's hard to get studios to buy into something that doesn't have some safe bet of a, um, existing franchise behind it already. And that's, that's really yeah. unfortunate. I will tell but you that I we're think- looking forward to your book being a movie <laughs> <laughs> someday. That's the fantasy, right? Well, I, I hate myself for that book. I will very honestly tell you, I, I show you how it looks, but I, I, I really hate myself for it because, uh, it's such a, well, we're, we're, all, we're all rooting for you. We see your, your posts on Facebook talking about it all the time. You. And it's, it's, thank it's, you. it's going to be a patience, uh, process, but 10 years, 10 years in the making. But, uh, yeah, wow. when, when you said that, the first thing that fell on my mind was, uh, you have some great authors out there, really graphic novels and stuff like that, but mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. it's impossible to open doors. It's impossible. And they are always saying that we don't, we don't have enough new material. And I can tell yeah. you with my inside 44 and you saw it. It's pretty cool. Let's say it like that. <laughs> and, uh, I approach them and everybody's like, go away, go away. Too much, uh, too much investment. I mean, if it's too much investment for you, $20,000, then we are in a problem. We are in a problem to print the book and everything. So, so it's, it's very strange world when you start digging in it and seeing how it works. And, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a low risk environment right now. I think people, in the economy are playing it a little bit safe. Yeah, that's absolutely true. You're also making a book and right. Eventually. Yeah. In process. In process. More, 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 more information to come later, but yeah, looking forward to that. I, I, I did my uh, test book uh, a while back. Um, I don't know if I copyright here. If you it's, want it's another shot, book that's packed up, I think, but yeah, I did I 20 copies of it, <laughs> but I wanted to see what stuff looked like on paper. You know, that was, that yeah. was my first kind of, um, prototype. Um, yeah. cause I wanted to look at the scale of things. I wanted to see how my lights and darks looked when they're flattened out to a, a non, um, light emitting surface. Cause I, I do all my work for the most part on a, on a Wacom yeah. screen, which you get that, that value range with uh backlighting so when you're printed your blacks are going to be blacker but your whites are not going to be as bright of course because they're not illuminated and i wanted to see what that would look like so if i had a white car and a white background uh do i lose it or you know what does it look like and then i was also interested in you know what does a drawing look like across the uh the gutter a two-page spread of something and there's a lot of art of books they make for like the marvel movies and personally i think most of them are overscaled they go across two pages and it's like a 2000 pixel wide image and it's blown up and and everything's just blurry and dark you can't tell what's going on it's like i'd rather see that condensed to a single frame on a single page where i can see the whole kind of thing and i i think they they churn these books out so fast that they they never kind of check them so they they look at it on a screen but they they don't like print and check and I, I think they don't care as well because sometimes the art of book comes out before the movie does. Right. Yeah. And they just, it's another thing where they're making money off it and it's a system. It's like all the making of Marvel books are a particular size and, um, and they're, they're kind of a similar level of quality and there's not a lot of writing in them. And, uh, you know, some are better than others, but, uh, you know, we always want to see the, the cool sketches you know, the development stuff. And a lot of times we don't get to see that thinking process. They only show us like the, the full color storyboard um, or the kind of the, the scene kind of shots that are all rendered. But yeah, I don't know the, the book business, we can talk about it later, but <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a difficult one. And I really admire that you're, you're going at it on your own trying to do it that way. But yeah, sh- the shipping shipping costs, I'm sure, is is pretty crazy. In addition to storage, 
printing is not cheap and it's all about volume. You know, the, the bigger your volume is, the cheaper it is. But yeah, yeah. if you're shipping one book, you know, it, we used to like want to get these uh, books from Japan, like anime artwork books, Miyazaki stuff and like Mecca uh, design books and stuff. And you, you look at one on eBay and it's like, oh, it's only $40, but then the shipping is the same price as the book. And so you have to like bundle a whole bunch together to make it worth your, your time to get it shipped. It it is a very strange market now when I when you when we talk about it and the world economy is burning currently. So if you want to check the world economy, my friends were over that to do economy and they were on the stock market in New York and so on. They always tell me just check how much shipping is if you want to check how economy is doing in the world. Oh uh, really? That's a bellwether, huh? Yeah, they always say just because it needs gasoline, it needs uh, statistics, logistics. Uh, oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So, so, so just check that and you will know if world is okay. They always say it like <laughs> that. And, and I will tell you this, I've been doing logistics for Inside 44. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but now that you mentioned yep. the, the shipping. And I have three books. Each book is 2.5 kilos, which is 4.7 pounds, something like that. And wow. then I have a uh, have a fulfillment center where i will store 1500 books and i will ship them from there blah 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 there is a whole organization and then they send me the list how much shipping costs so mm-hmm. there is shipping by regions for usa per book it was because the the fulfillment center is in usa it will cost me 10 to 11 dollars in usa for one book for mm-hmm. three books it will go 22 bucks but if you send it to germany uh, one book will cost thirty-seven dollars to ship. Uh, oh my gosh! All three books will cost seventy-seven dollars. If you send them to Russia, and Russia is specifically because of everything pointed out, shipping one book is ninety bucks, and shipping all three is one hundred and eighty bucks. Shipping to Brazil, it's one hundred and twenty bucks for 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 uh, no seventy-nine bucks for one book. And you're like, who the hell is going to buy this? Who the hell is going to buy my book when the shipping is more expensive than this? <laughs> so, so yeah. That's too bad because the, the the printed book I enjoy so much better than the the virtual version. You know, because I can I can be in bed at night with the, the the bed lamp on, and and that's when I was a kid. I would I always fall asleep with a book, and you can just take it with you anywhere. You can take it to the coffee shop and enjoy it. And you know, when stuff is on paper, it's a different experience. <laughs> There is something magical about it. The, the screen yeah. can't use that. Yeah, the smell, the touch. It's literally like uh, energy from the words on it is coming back to you. When you read it on screen, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen at all. No, it's different. It's completely different. Uh, I want to talk about the next thing. And that's, uh, so you have students that come and uh, you teach them design. What is mm-hmm. the thing that students mostly struggle when they come to, to, to learn from you? Um, well, the, the classes I teach are, are a combination of design and VizCom. And mm-hmm. VizCom, you can, you can get through a lot and teach a lot in um, a short time. But design is very difficult to teach. Um, aesthetic kind of decision-making yeah. is very hard to teach in a very short amount of time because... Um, there, there's not a right and a wrong to things. And I, I can say this looks better if you do this, but it's, it's hard to put into words why uh, sometimes. And it, there's not like a set of rules to that. Um, yeah. There's a, there's kind of a set of suggestions like this would generally look, work, work better if you do it this way. And I talk about line volume and, um, areas of rest, areas of detail, that sort of thing. And, uh, there is some golden ratio stuff. Uh, in terms of uh, detail and line that you can apply to things to get kind of quick beauty easily. Yeah. Um, but yeah, students, I think they, they want to learn uh, how to make cool looking stuff very quickly. And um, some students have it more naturally than others. Um, I, I don't think I got it for a long time. And I'm, I'm better at it now, but it's something that I still, still work at, you know, creating beautiful design and creating new shape as well. So that's, that's the most difficult combination is do something that's very new 
but also make it aesthetically pleasing because most aesthetic uh, comfort comes from familiarity. So to introduce something that's uh, very new and at the same time uh, be comfortable enough on the eye that it looks beautiful is, is a big challenge. So yeah, the design aspect of it, I think is, is probably one of the most difficult things. Um, perspective is, you know, one of those things that we, we always kind of harp on, but there is a right and a wrong and it's easy to explain, um, sketch over and, and say, these lipses are off. Uh, here's how you do it. Um, so a lot of the time is, is spent on that sort of thing, but I'll do sketch overs and, um, I can say it looks better when you do this, do this, make this shorter, make wheelbase longer, um, make this line have more volume here. So it matches another, um, I, I try to teach a little bit about, um, kind of a, a inherent styling theme that exists in a design and making all the parts feel like they're cohesive to that, that statement, make it seem like it's in the same, uh, key chain set of key changes for the, the music that you're putting together. Um, you know, that's, that's something that's a little bit easier to explain probably, but it's a challenge to learn. It's a challenge to, to teach as well, uh, for sure. And when I was going to school, I, I remember there was a lot of ISCOM stuff, but, um, I, th I think that a lot of teachers, they don't know how to teach aesthetic, uh, decision-making and aesthetic, um, new idea creation. That's, yeah. that's, a, and, and I think that's why a lot of students just resort to, um, using Pinterest board as a paint palette and doing design assemblage essentially, because that's the easiest way to kind of get around creating something new out of their head from scratch. That's beautiful is they'll just, they'll use something that already exists and, and, uh, rephrase it. Yeah. But I think it's not possible uh, I mean, professors, th there are not a lot of them that teach that. That's, that's, there is no question about it. I went to design schools. They teach you technicalities, how to draw and so on, but nobody teaches, very rarely they teach design. But in their defense, I don't think it's possible to learn design in four years. And I'm very openly saying that because... Yeah, yeah. I, I mean... No, it's, it's a continuous process for sure. And, and you don't 100% achieve it at any point. Some, some people get there faster than others, um, for sure. I but, mean, yeah, you can teach it, you can teach it, you give them the basics, but, uh, design is solitude. Eventually designer needs to find that voice because it really mm -hmm. is not possible that the other person gives, gives 100% back to them. If it, if the yeah. other if the professor gives them 10%, that's already a lot when it comes to design. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really think about that all the time. And that's why I think a lot of um, design studios are looking to hire talent that comes out of school because it's raw. It's raw uh, kind of idea creation at that point. And students are doing wacky stuff and they haven't figured out you know, how to make it sweet yet. But the design executives and managers, they're like, I like that they're presenting something new. I know how to make it sweet. So... Yeah. Um, and, and they're at, at an age where they're kind of probably doing what they did 20 years ago. So they're looking for the new idea and then they will take it to refinement for, you know, production or whatever. So it's a combination of an experienced eye mixed with the youth uh, creativity, unbridled kind of creativity and that wacky idea creation. So probably the sweet spot is maybe like midway through your career where you have the design sense to tune a design move all those lines, get them really kind of sweetened up, but it's also a new combination of services that didn't exist before. Um, and then later on you get into being like a design manager and your, your, uh, big skill is being able to spot new designs, um, from, from the younger designers and assemble them in a way that's, uh, palatable to the, the broad consumer market. Yeah. I'm just thinking now, also when I was studying, uh, I was pushing my ideas very forward too much sometimes. And, uh, I had a really good teacher of design that went to 
he was in USA. He's Serbian, but he went to USA. Uh, I don't remember which was the university. Was it Savannah University of Design or it was a Boston oh, yeah. mm-hmm. I don't know which one, but he went to that one. Yeah. And, and, and he studied there. And then, then uh, I was becoming a little bit frustrated because they were always pulling my ideas backwards. And, uh, and he said, listen, it's good that you're pushing ideas that much forward because you have the possibility to always go back. But other yeah, people yeah. don't push designs too much forward. They don't have possibility to go forward. And mm-hmm. it gave me the wings. It gave me the wings to think outside of the box all the time and come back and come back and come back. And that led to some good designs, I think, because he gave me the yeah, wings yeah. just by the sentence, you know. Yeah, I, I've heard that before from teachers I've had as well, is you, you push far and then then you you bring it back. And I, I don't think I push far enough. I'm always trying to do more of that. I'm a little bit conservative in that respect. I, I get hung up on the VizCom, enjoy that too much. So I'm not a great designer, but I think I'm a pretty good um, illustrator that combines ideas in a new way. Um, but yeah, uh, that's something I, I wish I could do more of. I, I think a lot of your designs have some great kind of newness to them and freshness, but also... I can see distinct uh, voice that that says Darmar in your stuff, in your detailing. Mm-hmm. You know, there's some identifiable uh, see guitar there. I, I, I call it like music licks. You know, little yeah. little fills in between the the melody. You know, that are kind of distinctive to you. I recognize. Thank you, but uh, I think that uh, Arthur Rodrigo and other creative pod guys, Yasid, would strongly yeah. disagree that you don't have a design style, as you say, that you don't design. We strongly disagree with that. I will just say I vote <laughs> for John when we did the, the competitions and all the stuff <laughs> in 2016. I fooled you over with the pretty sketch. <laughs> no, 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 please, please. It was amazing. It was amazing. It was something new. It was something fresh. Yeah. And new. That was, a, that was a lot of fun. That yeah. all those prompts. I like, I like when we have a prompt to work with. That's why I like the, the Goropod stuff so much. Cause it's, it's ideas that um, if I sit down with a piece of paper, I may not have an idea to start out with, but somebody gives me a prompt. And it's like, Oh, this is exciting. You know, um, it's already set in my mind in motion. I don't have to think of the uh, the storytelling in advance. It's, it's provided for me. I like to do that. But that that was a that was a good time. We 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 produced a lot of really cool stuff. Yeah, Art Martin's uh, amazing stuff and Rodrigo's stuff too. Yeah, they are also coming to the podcast. Arthur is next. It's gonna be fun. Nice Arthur style. I, I mean, that guy is insane when his drawings, his design, very sleek, very slim. I love it. I love it. Yeah, he works only a half mile away from me. We keep on talking <laughs> about meeting up sometime for lunch, but I haven't done it yet. Oh, my God. I, I have run into a couple of times in L.A., but um, yeah, <laughs> when, when you finally make it here, we'll all get together. We'll have a, a reuni- reunion of our online uh, design uh, crew. There is no question about it. Trust me, we are organizing it for sure. And you can expect me next year around October because I said I'm coming uh, next year for sure. There is no question about it. I'm coming 99% next year. All right. You have to have a bag full of books too. That's the, the cheapest way to get them here. Yeah, I hope. I hope I will publish till then. Let's let's hope I publish them before I die, as my friends told me three, three days ago. They said, yeah. let's hope you publish them before you die. How, how, how slow it's going <laughs> Are you going to be here for uh, Lightbox 2024? Yeah, Lightbox 2024. I will be in okay. Canada. Great. There is no question. I was supposed to be this year, but some things uh, happened. But uh, I said next year, and I'm already organizing now the trip. So, yeah, so yeah. it's good that you mentioned it and you reminded me. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I missed this year, so I'll definitely make it next year. Next year we go together then. It's a deal. Sure. We right. have a deal, John. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask you one more thing. Uh, All right. Before before we finish, it has been a great talk. I really enjoyed talking about design with you because we touch many subjects and we elaborate on them. And I think it's very useful to be the designer that can talk about that kind of stuff because it's very important for me also to I learn new stuff from you when you mention them. I start to think in a different direction. Uh, my, my question for the end will be, because we have been talking mostly about having a unique voice. 
uh, the question would be, what would you advise your people so they create a unique vo voice? And I'm not talking about in design way, unique, unique voice, mm -hmm. but what do they do beside design to create a unique voice? That's my question. Well, I've, I've found that, um, you get a lot of value out of reaching outside of, uh, the scope of whatever you're working on or the process you're working on and bring something in, in an unexpected way. So, um, I, th I think people need to look outside of their area, their industry for their inspiration. Don't, don't look inward. So again, don't look at the Pinterest boards of other yeah. car designers that are your same age, uh, producing cars. Now, um, look at, um, uh, architecture, of course, go to that, uh, wristwatch design, product design. Um, and, I, I think there's there's a lot to be uh, gained from going to museums and looking how the Egyptians sculpted uh, the surfacing mm -hmm. on um, on uh, Egyptian sculpture is so e interesting because uh, they did a lot of symmetrical stuff for the the mummies and stuff so they have this like perfect symmetry that applies to automotive and ve vehicular forms you see like how they do a face or something and like ancient like Persian stuff as well. Um, I, years ago when I was going to school, I, I wanted to, I didn't finish a project, but I was looking at, um, uh, Inuit, um, like Alaskan and, and no Northwest, uh, Native American, uh, wood carving. And also they did a lot of graphic stuff, but there's a lot of like thick to thin is all like graphic design. That was very, very precise. It almost like, looks like it was computer done, but, um, those types of shapes could be applied to your design, um, in a new way. And I, I think you just keep on looking at all these different genres, different art forms, and just absorbing it and mixing it all together. Um, I think if you, you stay focused and you have like two favorite automotive designers and they're your contemporaries, you're not going to add anything to the conversation. You need to start mixing things in there in a new way. So it's, it's like fusion food. Um, yeah. You know, you're mixing cultures uh, around the world and and taking little bits of them and and mixing them together in new ways. And as a, a character as well, you know your your own personal character, um, looking outside of your your area of expertise and just being more culturally rounded. Um, so stop playing video games. <laughs> stop watching Marvel movies too much and start to sprinkle in other stuff. You know, you can still do that, but, um, watch classic, you know, French cinema or, um, look at some of the, the Scandinavian artists like Anderson or, um, you know, that's doing the watercolors, Carl Anderson, I think is his name. Um, you know, some of these more obscure designers that may not be in your art history book, you know, start to look at, um, the more obscure stuff. I've, I've always been a, uh, a promoter of obscure music, you know, <laughs> don't watch, uh, don't listen to like top 40 radio. I'm always like, I'm going to my friends, like, uh, seeing what music collections they have and looking at the, the stuff that I didn't recognize on the small labels and finding a lot of interest in that stuff that, you wouldn't want to play on the radio. You couldn't play on the radio because it's too long or it's too abusive or um, abrasive or vile or whatever, you yeah. know, um, you know, that sort of stuff that's challenging um, I think is more interesting and, and you gain a, a lot from just stretching out mentally and culturally and finding inspiration in, in new places. Understood. Okay. I like that. Advice. That's a ramble. I, I ramble a lot. That's, that's my, my you trademark. Ramble, maybe. You I don't connect know. the dots very good. You connect the dots very good. Maybe. <laughs> so I hope so. It's, it's a web. Yeah, I, 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 web. I, really enjoyed, I really enjoyed this because there was a lot of pieces to take from and to learn from you and how you think. Oh, I hope so. That's and good. I think that's the design way of thinking how you're talking.
<laughs> so this is a good yeah. uh, well it's it's good. great you're doing this because you're bringing people that have different types of careers too so i i hope you get um, a lot of people listening to this that um maybe be stuck in where they are right now or they need some optimism in their own kind of personal journey to being a designer or an artist and um i, th I think there's a lot to be gained by listening to a lot of different opinions about things from different uh generations um yeah so you'll have all sorts of people on um that'll have something different to offer based on their perspective of when they got into the industry and the tools they're using now and used in the past um but yeah i mean i i feel very lucky to be where i am um but it was a lot of hard work as well and and you you know it as well you're you're one of the hardest working designers i know um Thanks. and uh it's it's very very tough to to do it from from your location you know being in the united states everything's a little bit more accessible to us but you know the internet brings us closer together and i think the tools you've used um through social media um you know to get our creative bot crew together um really kind of knocks down all those borders and makes it accessible for everybody but um yeah keep keep up the good work Thank you. Same to you, John. Ladies and gentlemen, this is John Fry, amazing person and amazing designer. I'm really that he decided to join us. Hit the subscribe button if you still haven't, and I will see you on the next episode. Take care. Bye. Okay. See ya.